Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the J. Willard Marriott Library. My name is Rick Anderson. As uh, interim dean and university librarian, I'd like, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here for the second Pathways to Peace lecture by Dr. Tariq Ramadan. We're honored to be able to co-sponsor this lecture along with the City Library and the Tanner Human Rights Center. And we're particularly pleased to be able to do so in light of our deep connection to Middle East studies here at the U as host of the Aziz S. Atiyah Middle East Library, which is one of the largest and most extensive such libraries in North America. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Tom Maloney, who serves both as director of the Barbara L. and Norma, Norman C. Tanner Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy, and as chair of the Economics Department in the College of Social and Behavioral Science, who will introduce Dr. Ramadan. Tom? Thanks very much, Rick. Um, as Rick mentioned, this is uh, the second lecture in a series called Pathways to Peace, which will be taking place over the next uh, three weeks or so at various places uh, here in Salt Lake. The purpose of the series is to reflect on currents of potential change in persistent conflicts and long-term policies related to war, peace, and security, including changes in the Middle East related to the Arab Spring and changes in the focus and implementation of US military policy. Our next event in this series will be a week from today, next Thursday, at the Hinckley Institute of Politics at 1045 in the morning, when anthropologist David Vine of American University and my colleague Ken Jameson, an economist here at the University of Utah, will discuss US military strategy in the Obama era, global presence, and local resistance. Um, a full schedule of Pathways to Peace events is available at the Tanner Human Rights Center website, and I know that uh, a, a few flyers have circulated around here as well. Um, in addition to the, the groups that Rick mentioned, I also want to uh, thank uh, several other collaborators that we've been working with, Westminster College, uh, the Utah Valley uh, University Peace and Justice Studies Program, uh, the School of Humanities and Social Science at Salt Lake Community College, uh, the Religious Studies Program here, uh, again, the Salt Lake Public Library, as well as some community groups, the Gandhi Alliance for Peace, Utahns for a Just Peace in the Holy Land, the Wasatch Coalition for Peace and Justice, and Peaceful Uprising. So our speaker today is Dr. Tariq Ramadan. He's the a professor of contemporary Islamic studies at Oxford University. He holds an MA in philosophy and French literature and a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Geneva. He's been recognized by Time Magazine as one of the world's 100 most influential intellectuals and by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top global thinkers of 2012, as well as for several years before 2012. Um, you'll forgive me if I don't list his entire uh, dossier of affiliations and honors and awards. If I did, uh, he would have very little time to talk. Um, last night at the Salt Lake City Main Library, Professor Ramadan spoke to a packed house on the topic of Islam and human rights. How will the Arab Spring bring peace to the Middle East? That was a very provocative uh, and, and very invigorating talk. I hope uh, many of you were there. Um, he, in that talk, developed some of the themes in his recent book, Islam and the Arab Awakening. Today he will talk to us about another of his many innovative uh, and ambitious projects, uh, the Research Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics. And he will specifically address the topic, the needs of ethics when dealing with an Islamic legal system, bioethics, environment, and gender. So join me in welcoming Dr. Tariq Ramadan. much better okay thank you thank you for your invitation here and for being uh, uh, here this morning once again after the lecture uh, yesterday uh, I'm pleased to be here and as I said it's the, my first visit in in, in uh, Solklitz city uh, and uh, I have been meeting people since I arrived and, and for me it's quite uh, uh, interesting and important not only to share views, but also for the, the coming uh, uh, years to be able to, to understand what common challenges we have and in which way we can uh, within academia, but also within the civil society work together. And here today 
it's a talk uh, about uh, some of the challenges the uh, Islamic tradition is facing. And while I am going to, to talk about this, many of you, if you are from the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition, or even the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu tradition, or if you are atheist, or if you are agnostic, you will understand that uh, uh, it's coming back to you, in fact. While I'm talking about what we are experiencing, you will see that this also has to do with the contemporary challenges of our world when it comes to questioning the ethical dimensions of our life. Now, what I want to say is uh, the need for ethics when it comes to the legal system, it's important. And I will explain this from within the Islamic tradition for you to understand that, uh, uh, the, the, for you to understand the roots from where I'm talking, and then to come from the particular of our tradition <laughs> to the general of our common uh, challenges when it comes to applied ethics today. Let me start by the end and ask ourselves, you are students or you are teachers and you are professors, you can be also uh, dealing with the civil society. And we all would agree, if we come to one discussion about the world today and say, looking at what is happening in the political field, looking at what is happening into the economic, or uh, when we deal with economics as a science or as an ideology, when it comes to environment, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to gender issues, or when it comes to uh, some questions that we may have about arts and entertainment, the first intellectual attitude when it comes to this is to ask the question, and very often the, the answer is positive, do we need ethics when, it deal, when we deal with all these dimensions? Now, look, you look at nature and you know how much we are dealing with global warming today. We deal with uh, economy uh, and uh, the whole crisis that we are experiencing, where we heard politicians telling us there is a lack of ethics in the way we are dealing. We even heard the former uh, uh, French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, following in the footsteps of Stiglitz and Soros, who were very much involved in the whole discussion, were saying we need more regulations in economy, meaning we need to moralize capitalism. If this is possible, I'm not sure. But this was a question. Moralize means more ethics. We need more responsibility. We need to regulate. The free market is now killing uh, hundreds of thousands of people daily uh, uh, because of uh, the way the system is working. And with the crisis, we saw what happened in this country one of the uh, richest countries in the world where we have people just uh, losing their house, losing their, uh, 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 their life. In fact, this was completely destroyed in the name of a crisis where we had some people dealing with money with no ethics, with no morality, with no accountability. So if we start by the end of the whole thing saying, don't we need this? This is questioning every single philosophy that we can have and every single religion. What is your contribution from your perspective? If you are an atheist and if you are an agnostic, if you are a, a, a Christian, if you are a Jew, a Muslim or a Buddhist, what is your contribution in this discussion? Do you have something to contribute? Do you have something to say? Do you have something to give as something which is an ethical framework that you propose as the essential questions that we have to ask to humanize the whole discussion, to make it ethical, and to try to uh, come with uh, not only dreamed answers, say we should do, it would be good if, and then the people are still being killed and nature is destroyed. This is the very essence of applied ethics. It has to be realistic, it has to be uh, 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 thought in the light of the contemporary challenges. Now I'm coming from uh, the Islamic uh, perspective and from within I'm dealing with these questions and I just want to promote this to make you understand from where I'm coming and then share with you 
some of the views that we may have coming from our different uh, 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 universes of, uh, uh, of frames of reference. When it comes to Islam, and the first science in Islam is not theology. In fact, theology, which is the discourse on God, is something which came very late in the Islamic tradition. Because what the first scholars get, uh, got at the beginning is, you don't speak about God. You say about God what God is saying about himself in his revelation. So theology is not central. What was the first science was the legal science, what we call in Islam fiqh which is translated, and we have a big problem with translation from Arabic words to English or Western languages, because very often we take what Orientalists were saying, and sometimes we are not precise enough. In fact, fiqh is Islamic law and jurisprudence. It's not only jurisprudence. Fiqh is already the framework, and then how do you deal with new challenges, and how do you come with new answers for new challenges? But there is a framework, a legal framework, and the first scholars in Islam were dealing with this, were dealing with reading the scripture sources, and we have in Islam two sets of uh, uh, scriptures, the revelation, the Quran, and then the prophetic traditions, what the prophet, the messenger for the Muslims, the last messenger said, did, or approved during his life. This is where we have the two sets of texts. So reading these sources, reading these texts, and something which is interesting is the text the Quran is revealed and revealing the principles, and the Prophet's life is revealing its, uh, their implementation in his daily life. So you have something which is practical and something which is theoretical, as these are the principles that you have to rely on. Now, this was the first science, and what they were doing is to try to understand, okay, these are rules that we find in the text, and what we should do is to understand how to implement them in uh, our daily life. And they started at the beginning to categorize these principles. We have principles or we have practices that are connected to our belief, the creed, which is in Arabic is called al-aqidah. There is not real practical dimension here, is what you believe which is beyond what is perceivable or uh, uh, sensitive, it's beyond our perception. These are the six pillars of faith in Islam, and they are not going to change. What the Muslims believed at the beginning is exactly what they believe now. This is immutable, transhistorical. The Muslims are fasting today as they were fasting in the past. And any religion or any philosophy based on principles would say there are some principles and some practices that are not related to uh, ge to geography and to culture, they are transcultural, transgeographical, and transhistorical. This is one. The second dimension is uh, so these are the six pillars of faith, and we have five pillars of practice. If you start uh, learning about Islam, you will know that uh, uh, all what he said is Islam has five pillars. The testimony that there is only one God, five prayers a day, fasting, giving the uh, purifying social tax, and the pilgrimage. We all know this. This is not going to change. So what the scholars extracted from the text are principles and a legal framework which is immutable, transhistorical, and this is not going to change. And then they also extracted from the scriptural sources the legal framework on prohibition and obligation that are not going to change. For example, the Muslims, wherever they are, they don't drink alcohol. They avoid uh, 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 dealing as much as possible with anything which has to do with you know, uh, interest. Normally, this should be the case. It's, we have prohibition here that are central and essential about pork, about the way we dress, about... So these are also duties and obligation. And then we have other principles that are here, but should be thought in the light of the context to be able to, to, be, able to be faithful to the objectives, not only the literal understanding of the rule. So you have things or principles, whatever is the context, you implement them. Others, you have to think about them in the light of the context because this is something that is what we call in Arabic, meaning they are changeable. 
So the scholars were dealing with a legal framework, understanding there are fundamentals and there are things that are changeable. Who is going to decide? First, the scholars are going to read the scriptural sources, and then this has to, do to, to be done with the human agency. No revelation without a mind to read it. So the minds and the intellect is the mediator from the text to the reality. We need the, 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 the mind, and this is why they were saying, and why do we need the mind? Because not only you have to understand the rules, but you have to understand something which was done from the very beginning by the scholars. Look, I want you to understand this because anyone who has studied law can understand what I mean here. Because you will have this implemented and has an impact on our contemporary discussion. They were saying, okay, we have a law here when it is said, for example, you Muslims, you have to avoid alcohol. You don't drink alcohol. So why? Question why? means that you have to try to find in the text or in what was said by the messenger something which is the raison d'être of the prohibition, which is the raison d'être is in Arabic, why? Or you are going to have another word which is also very close is sometimes you might have a prescription and you want to get the wisdom in Arabic, al-hikmah. Why? It means there is something that could be wise in pre, pre, uh, pro, the, the prohibition, for example, of alcohol. Many people would say, yes, you know, alcohol is not bad if you drink just not too much. That's true. It could be good. The problem with human being is to know the limits. They know when it's not too much, and sometimes they go too far, and the consequences of going too far is to lose your mind. And the consequences of using your mind when you drink too much, humanly is not good, just to put it in a simple, in a soft way. Okay, so the point here is, think about al-hikmah, which is the wisdom. There is a wisdom that sometimes is not completely or clearly put for the mind, but you have to think about it. And you have another dimension is the objective. So the raison d'être could be sometimes the same as the objective. What do we want to reach? But it could be, the raison d'être could be for now, and the objective could be within or throughout history. There is something that we have to reach, which is al-qasd. And there is a school called, in the legal tradition, al-maqasid, the objectives that we want to reach. So the scholars were coming with the legal framework and coming with, we need law and we need principles and we need a legal framework, but it's very important always to get in mind that sometimes you need to get why, the raison d'être, for which reason, the objective, and what is the wisdom. And sometimes there is no reason. Meaning that this is something which is very interesting for any intellect. Sometimes you have something which is said, you say, there is no reason. And say, why there is no reason? And from a spiritual viewpoint is, the reason for not having a reason is the very reason. <laughs> you know what does it mean? This is intellectual humility. Don't try to get the answer for everything. If you remember, Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, is saying sometimes you need to know that there are limits to what is right, uh, reasonable or rational. And you know this in your private life. If anyone is coming to you and to say, you know what, I want you to tell me in a rational way, why do you love this man or this woman? Try. <laughs> you can't. Because there are things that are beyond our rationality. But with the legal framework, sometimes we say, why do we pray five times a day and not six and not seven? Why, for example, when you read the Quran, there are some uh, chapters starting with, Alif, la, mim, letters, we don't know the meaning. This is a message which is sent to the human minds and the human intellect. Know that you should know, but know that you should never know. You are not going to know everything. Intellectual humility is spirituality. Spirituality is to acknowledge the limits. And sometimes with the rules, you don't always understand why, but sometimes you have to follow this in something which is a wise way of dealing with the scriptural sources and what are the principles. Having said that now, this is the beginning of the legal framework.
It's all good if we deal with it in such a way. What the Muslim or the Islamic civilization went through is something which is now putting us in a crisis. Because all what I said now is even if there is no reason, there is a reason. And in the great majority of the rules, we will find reasons for why we are doing what we are doing. Why? Because our religion is rational. It has to do with an ethical dimension. And in fact, even the messenger, when he came with all these principles, he said about himself, something which is essential for our understanding. Uh, in Arabic, he said, I was sent to beautify, to complete the good behavior. Having said this, to complete meant that my religion is not bringing it all. Things before me were already here. My religion is completing what was before, and you will find that in the ethical principle that he came with, you find the same ethical principles in Christianity, in Judaism, and even before in the spiritualities that we find in Buddhism and Hinduism. So to complete meant there is a history before my history. There is a history before my message. And he's completing the ethical one. But what he's saying is that, in fact, the essence of his mission is not to come with rules without meaning, but ethics with objectives. Ethics which we need to reach something. We need to have, in fact, the very essence of principles is what? To change your behavior. Conver convert your heart towards God in order to convert your behavior towards human beings. At the end, this is essential. It's not to say, I believe in God and this is not visible. You know, some of us today, they don't like religions and say, yes, my heart is with God. Now your mind and your body and your money, not very much with God. <laughs> and this is this device that we have. It's a very, very cheap way of dealing with your own belief. It's, uh, it has no visibility. It's something which is spirituality without commitment to some values. That's your choice. This is your freedom. But the point is that all our religions came with something which is essential. You, if you believe, it has to be visible. How? Through your behavior, through the way you deal with yourself, the way you deal with your uh, fellow human beings, and the way you deal with the, uh, the nature, animals, and everything. It has to be visible. Faith is visible through your behavior, not only through your words. Now the problem that the first scholars, when they came with the legal framework, they had all this in mind and they were constructing the legal framework in a way which is always we deal with people acting, we deal with people behaving, and we try to reach uh, 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 objectives and ethical, and ethical ground. What was the problem in our history? And this is why we need now to come back to the ethical teachings to, in order not to, be, uh, to deal with the legal framework which is losing its essence. When you are perceiving yourself in history as dominated by uh, uh, colonizers or another civilization, what will be the first attitude and the first frame on which you are going to rely to protect yourself is the legal framework. The legal framework is protecting you. And what happened in the Islamic tradition is because there was this perception that we lost this uh, power and this contribution to the world, the first attitude was to deal with, uh, uh, to deal with the legal framework in a defensive way, in a protective way. And when you deal with the law in a protective way, sometimes we end up being formalistic and not so much getting the essence of the law. And you end up with a discourse on prohibition. The dominant are free to do this, we are not, and we protect ourselves. This protective attitude towards law is changing the very nature of law. Law and limits were here to achieve something which was beyond, objective that were ethical. But if at the end you lose this, you end up coming with the law in a way which is not dealing with the substance of the law, but the protective dimension of the law. 
I want to give you an example here, which is not coming from the Islamic tradition. I'm a Western Muslim, and I live in the West, I live in Europe, I was born and raised, and now I'm dealing in Switzerland or in, uh, in Europe, and even here, it's happening here in your country, you all know that our legal framework and the f main principles of our legal framework is saying freedom of conscience, freedom of worship, do whatever you want as long as you respect the common law. It's open, it's an open system. And what we see now is because we are scared in Europe with this Muslim presence, we tend to read our legal framework in an exclusive way. Is these are our freedom, but be careful with, with them. Give you an example, we all agree you can dress where, how you want. And we have now people telling us in the West, a woman with a headscarf cannot go to school. So the legal framework which was open is read in a very protective way. So we are protecting ourselves from people who are putting us in danger. In fact, the problem is not in the law, because the law is the same. The problem is in the reader. It's not the text, the problem. The text, if you take it, it's open. But the readers, when they are scared, they tend to have a very narrow understanding of this is us protecting ourselves from them. In the Islamic tradition, we had exactly the same. It is an open system. We have something which is even say, saying in Islam, al fil ashya al ibaha the first principle in Islam is permission. And you end up in a protective way to always stress on prohibition. This is not possible. This is wrong. This is, you know, this kind of attitude which is a religious mindset that is so scared of the open world that you end up having a discourse on prohibitions and not on permissions, on the limits, not on the objectives. And if you come with this, you are distorting the very essence of the religious dimension, which is the limits are the limits on the road. But what is important is the way. These are the limits. The limits are showing you the way, but you end up looking at the limits and forgetting that there is a way. You forget that you are trying to reach something, and you end up being obsessed with the limitations in your daily life. And this is why many of the Muslims, as well, I would say, as many of the Christians and many of the Jews today, they don't like the religious discourse because the religious discourse is very often a defensive discourse. It's us versus their freedom and our principles. It's not our way to achieve, it's our way to protect. And if you come with this, you will forget the objectives. And this is where we should get rid of this mentality. This mindset is a problem because we reduce religion to something which is a protective house and not an open light. It's not to achieve, it's not a way, it's much more something which is resisting to a perceived world where there is no religion and no principles. So, in the Islamic uh, 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 history, we had this, which was happening with uh, the perception that we were dominated and the perception also that the global world is now less and less religious, so we need to come with principles and to very much stress on this. It's as if you are more Muslim when you stress on the limitations and not when you stress on the essence. So we speak about the way you have to pray, but not enough about why do you pray. So we teach you, you know how you have to pray? Like this. And it's very strict, that's fine, but this is the way I have to pray. Why? What is the meaning of praying? So, so it's as if someone is coming to you and say, this is the way you have to love me. That's fine, but teach me first to love you. Because <laughs> the way, okay, it's our limits, rules. Are you going to put rules on my love? Are you going to put the very essence of this dimension, what this mean, it means to, to love. Because at the end, what we are saying is God is love and we have to love God. This is what is said in the Quran. And when you deal with this interface dialogue, and this has been the case for 30 years, what I got from the, the Christians that I were dealing with, they were sending me a message, don't forget. There is something which is essential in our way of dealing with God is love. Love is essential. And to love him is essential. This is not coming from rules. It helps you to understand the rules, but talking about rules without love 
is missing the point, is missing the very essence. And then there is a third factor that we had in the Islamic tradition was something that we cannot deny, is a power struggle within the authoritative voices in Islam. And in fact, the fuqaha, the jurists, the people who are dealing with law, became the reference in everything. And we had people saying, no, what is the most important thing is the Sufi tradition, the mystical side, the spiritual side. And someone saying, no, 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 be careful. With the mystical side, we are losing the rules. So the, what is important is the rules. And others were saying, no, rationality is, my reason is the main reference. And we have power struggle. And very quickly, the people who became the reference in the Islamic tradition became the jurists and with an understanding because they were protecting the very essence. But the problem is that we have this without getting and creating a link between the rules and the ethical ground is something which is essential. I'll give you an example which is so important. If you look at uh, food today, and we know that in the Islamic tradition we have halal meat. You heard the, the word halal? Halal means slaughtered in the right way. So you don't slaughter the animal for the sake of another god or for the sake of uh, any uh, association and power. It's just for the sake of God and you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, in the name of God and God is the greatest. And you do this. This is the way you slaughter the animal and you say it's halal. So you can eat it. Okay, that's fine. This is the rule. And you can keep on saying, this is the rule. Now, the objective of the rule was, when you do this, you have to be very cautious about the way you treat the animal, about the way you avoid suffering, about the way you nurture the animal. It's a philosophy with rules. It's not rules without philosophy. Now we have scholars saying, it's halal, eat it. But the way the animals are treated, the way they are uh, uh, nurtured, the way we have now this industrialized way of making all the animals suffer with no dignity, this is unethical. And you end up having something which is legally right, ethically wrong. How do you deal with this? So you have to come back to say, let us come with the ethical questioning of our rules. Not to change the rules, but to reconsider our behavior with the rules. It's not enough to tell me, treat, kill the animal like this. And don't to, to teach me how to keep the animals alive and nature and human beings and the human dignity. It's a, it's a philosophy, ethics is questioning the philosophy of the law, not only the implementation or the literal implementation of the rules. You understand my point? It's so important here in all what we are doing. So, in fact, there is a necessity here to come with the ethical. And the ethical questioning is always questioning the objectives. What do you want to achieve? And we, know to do, we need to do this even with our religion. At the end, we should avoid this distinction in the Islamic tradition, and we have it in the Christ Christian tradition, in the Jewish tradition. We should stop having something which is a religious way based on the legal way and the prohibitions way to deal with God and our religion, and the spiritual side which is missing in everything. We need to reconcile heart and practice, the spiritual side. We have to reconcile the two. And this is something which is coming from the ethical ground. In fact, you might pray five times a day. You might uh, 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 fast one month a year. And at the end, in your behavior, in the way you deal with your neighbors, in the way you deal with human beings, in the way you deal with the poor people, you don't get it. So your practice is a formal practice, is not transforming your, your life. When we have a messenger asking God, we are asking you, I'm asking you to love the poor, not only to serve them, but to love them. It's a, it's a way of life. How do you end up loving the poor? It's something which has to be, you, you have to be involved. It's not only by praying five times a day that you are going to get it. And then you come with what he said. I am here to beautify the good behavior, to complete the good behavior. So even in our practice, there is this relationship between ethics the objectives and practice, principles. 
And this is where you understand, for example, many Muslims are fasting one month a year. Very good. It is important. In all the traditions, it is said in the Quran that fasting is every, in all the traditions. You find it in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Christianity, in Judaism. It's everywhere. Why? Because it's a way you are dealing with your nature. It's natural to eat. It's spiritual to avoid eating and to think about eating. Why? Because it gives you the meaning of life. You eat and you are not even aware that you are eating and, and drinking. Stop it for a while. Think about it. What does it mean to eat? What does it mean to... So some Muslims are doing this one month a year. That's very good. The only problem that we have is not when they fast during the day, it's the way they break their fast during the night. <laughs> Why? Because there is a lack of ethical understanding. They eat the double. So you go to the supermarket everywhere and you see the people, you know, the people who want to make business, Exactly the same. You know, we were concerned about the fact that Christmas is becoming a very capitalistic, you know, festival. It's much more about money. Give you money once a year and eat more and have gifts and forget about the very essence of what it means to celebrate Christmas. Muslims with Ramadan are now very much colonized with the same mindset. They fast during the day and they eat and eat during the night. And some of them, they even live during the night and sleep during the day. And they call it, I'm fasting. No, you are, you are sleeping. <laughs> so the point here is how do you connect this? It's very deep. It's a very, no, you, you can laugh, but it's very serious in all the fields. So when it comes, for example, with all the field that we have, all the challenges of our time, we have our religious references, and I will end with this by saying, okay, now, recently we had a very deep discussion on bioethics. And bioethics is how do you deal with, you know, the borderline situations where you deal with, uh, for example, uh, uh, life and very critical questions about uh, uh, medicine, for example. And these are questions, you can come with a very understanding prohibition of all this, but ethics, it's important here. Because, for example, in all the medical side, when we have to deal with organ transplantation, organ donation, you have people now who are saying, you know, for the poor people, they can sell their organs because this is the way for them to survive. Can you imagine what, it, what could be the reality of this if we end up saying to the poor people, you can sell your organs to survive, meaning that we are not going to ask ourselves as rich people how we are dealing with the, the economic order so these are questions that we have to challenge, exactly the same as the gender situation. Very often, it is said that in Islam, we have a problem with women. And I keep on repeating the same phrase, Islam has no problem with women, but Muslims have. Muslim men have. Because their understanding of the scriptural sources here is problematic. And then is, we ha this is why we have to come to the objectives. What do we want to achieve? And you understand here in ethical ground that there is something which is a discourse which is missing. When you want to talk about me as a human being, are you going to talk about me as a father, as a, as a, as a husband, as a son? I don't want you to talk about me like this. The first discourse that you have to have on me is about me as a human being, not as my role within the society, but as me as a human being. If you look at the Islamic literature in the legal framework, it's very much about the roles. Woman as a wife, woman as a mother, and woman as a daughter. Stop it, start with the beginning. A woman as a woman. What is the dimension here that we have to stress? And this is ethical, it's not a legal understanding of the roles, it's a philosophical, ontological discussion on the being, the essence. And this is where equality starts. If you start the discussion, you speak about men, about the essence, and you speak about women as to their role, the only people who can do that are men. Of course, they talk about themselves, our essence, and about you, your role. But when it comes to the serious discussion, is the role, it's essential. Who, what are we talking about when it comes to spirituality, to, 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 it comes to the achievement? So you can get this. So what I, we... So you can understand the shift here that is necessary from a protective approach, a defensive approach, to something which is much more based on the ethical dimension, the objectives that we want to reach. So 
there is one book that I wrote, which was, for me, something that was, I was reaching a limit. The book was called Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation. Liberation of what? This mindset that is based only on the law and not enough on the ethical. And to reconnect the ethical ground and the legal ground. In fact, to reconnect the legal tradition with what was at the beginning, you start to understand the raison d'etre, you start to understand the objectives, you try to get the wisdom, you try to understand the meaning of a legal dimension. And you have to connect this. And to do this, you cannot just rely on the jurists. You need to have people coming from the other side of the knowledge. So the center is all based on this. I, after the, I wrote the book, for many years I have people saying, oh, your, your, your book is full of questions. Where are the answers? I don't have an answer. This is exactly the point of the book. The point of the book, if, if I had the answer, no, no, you know, just I can give you a very small book as you say, answer one, two, three, four, follow. We have this problem sometimes with our religion. We want someone to tell us exactly what are the answers. The critical thinking is very much disconnected from this deep faith. And I keep on repeating, no deep faith without critical thinking. Deep faith is based on one of the conditions is, is try to think, and especially in our society. So my last point is just to say, uh, after a while, when I, 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 was, uh, I, I had the opportunity to start a center, and this, this is the center you are referring to, which is a center on Islamic legislation and ethics, to reconnect the two. And in fact, it's with a vision, is to reconsider our methodology, and to come with scholars of the text, people who are influenced and based on the text only, and to make them work with people who are ulama, and be careful, ulama of the context, scholars of the context. And I make it clear in Arabic as well as in English that I'm calling them the same word. Ulama means scholars of the text and of the, of the context. Because in Arabic very often we say ulama and nusus, these are the, the scholars, and these are the specialists. Khubara, mutakhassisun. So there is, in fact, in Arabic itself, there is a difference of, you know, Understanding. These are the people who are the reference, and these are the people that sometimes we ask, ask them their opinion, tell us something about, you know, medicine, about economy. If you come with this understanding, you are not going to make it. Why? Because the legal framework is going to try to catch up with the knowledge and come with a very protective attitude. And we are very protective, but if we want to come with an ethical, we need to have the, the best knowledge of what are the challenges in our world. So we put them together in eight scholars, four from the text, four from the context. Now we, we want to deal with this issue, and you come. Some of the scholars are not Muslims. They are people of other faiths. For example, in one of our discussion on bioethics, we have Bichon, who is someone who is the, 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 the brightest minds in, in the field of bioethics. We have the same in politics. We are going to have the same in arts. I don't buy anything which has to do with Islamic arts. I call, I, I'm calling. Uh, I'm, I'm advocating something which is Islamic ethics in art when we deal with our imagination because I think we also have to think about this. Imagination and all the people who are saying, you know, art is all about freedom, that's fine. But still, there are artistic trends that are elevating you and some artistic trends that can destroy. So we have to at least ask the question which type of imagination and literature we want to promote. So this is where the center is working on this with Muslims and people of other faiths trying to come to this and trying to achieve this contemporary challenge, which has to do with reconnecting law and ethics, limits and objectives. And to get it right, you cannot be faithful to a limit if you forget that the limit is here to achieve a specific objective. So you better think about the objective instead of only coming with a very uh, narrow understanding of the legal framework. These are the questions, and I am sure that any one of you studying the legal framework or coming from the Jewish tradition or the Christian tradition or any kind of tradition, this is a discussion that you can understand. You, you can understand what I'm t talking about here. We have the common, these are the common challenges that we are sharing. So this is also something where we can come together let our interface dialogue, let our, let our pluralistic society, in this, in this room, you are coming from different religious traditions or with no religious tradition. Why don't we talk about this, which is what are the ethical challenges for us? 
in which way we are trying to defend the dignity of human being and not the legal tradition of prohibitions, but the dignity as an objective. Let us ask ourselves in our school system, are our school systems today promoting the dignity of our intelligence? Are we asked to be good citizens or to be efficient consumers or uh, uh, workers? What is the essence of our educational system? Some are putting money for us to be good consumers, not to be good critical citizens. And you can get degree with having very efficient knowledge as to your know-how. But why? That's another question. And you might become a very dangerous citizen if you start starting questioning why. Let us come to this discussion. And this is where you, as American citizens, you have to come together. And to talk about this, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, all this uh, interface dialogue and philosophical discussion about you are nice, I'm nice, let us be nice together. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> the world needs something else, I think. Thank you. On? Yes. <clears throat> we do have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions, so if you want to raise your hand, we have a couple of mics we can bring around. If you'd identify yourself, uh, maybe at the beginning of your comment uh, or question, thank you. Uh, Cadet Plushnitznik from the United States Air Force Academy. Um, Dr. Ramadan, my question for you is, in what way does taklid in the Islamic tradition influence um, ethical decision making and its application um, in, um, in fiqh, in society as a whole. That, that's exactly the point. Taqlid means imitation. So you have in the legal tradition some people who are following a tradition or following, like for example the literalists, they are following some uh, very, very narrow literalist understanding of the, the scriptural sources. So they are, they are moving by imitation. Imitation means, in fact, the only way for us to be faithful to the way the ancestors were is just to do the way they were doing. So we dress like them, we eat like them, and that's it. There are some contradictions in the way uh, they are dealing because it's impossible today to do everything, but in your private life, you dress, you think, you, uh, you just imitate. And you have traditionalists who are doing exactly the same. They follow a very specific school. So the opposite trend, and this is why my, uh, what I'm saying here, I'm not representing all the Muslims. I think that I, I, I'm not hesitating by saying I'm presenting the mainstream Muslim in Shia and Sunni tradition, the mainstream. But the opposite of this is a tajdeed to renew our understanding. In fact, if you look at the center, we have the brochure uh, 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 about the center that uh, present what we are doing. The logo of the center is tajdeed, meaning renewal. It's to renew our understanding. So when people are coming to me and some of the literalists are coming to me, I'm telling them, I don't have a problem with Islam. I have a problem with your mind. The problem is not the text. The problem is not the Quran. The problem is not the prophetic tradition. It's the way you read them. Is your mind a problem? And when I'm talking about renewal, I'm not talking about renewing Islam or reforming Islam. I'm talking about reforming the Muslim mind. So in the legal tradition, we have people who, are, who thinks that the only way in this world where everything is lost, we don't know how, you come to a very narrow understanding. And you know, intellectually speaking, sometimes it could be a first step. You feel that you are lost in the world, so you come to a very narrow understanding. So now I know what is right and what is wrong. I'm always, just very quickly, always coming with this story of someone who came to me, uh, and he told me, uh, uh, Sheikh, I have a question. I say, yes. He say, is music halal or haram? <laughs> so is music lawful and unlawful? I told you there are three answers. Some scholars are saying, unlawful, no music. Some others were saying, yes, with drums and with your voice, it's possible. 
And the third is saying, no problem with music, as long as this music is helping you to, there is a sense of elevation and it's not uh, 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 troubling you from just believing in God and being someone who is consistent and, and trying your best. So no problem with music, depends how you use it, how you deal with it. I said, okay, okay, that's fine. He left and he was playing guitar. Few months later, he came to me and said, you know what? I went to another scholar and he told me it's haram, unlawful, and I liked it. I said, okay, that's fine. We have three positions. You take the one you like. I said, you don't want the music to be halal, that's fine. And I, I smile and say, so now you don't listen and you don't play. He looked at me and said, no, I still play, but I know it's haram. <laughs> Look at the psychology. The psychology is a psychology of prohibition, even though his life is completely different. So when you don't have the critical mind and you don't know how, you better go to imitation than to go to critical thinking. What is good and then you have to balance. You have to take a decision, which is not easy. It's not easy to be open-minded, by the way. Easy to say, not easy to be faithful with an open mind. Hello, um, I'm Gün Selibelik from Economics Department and I'm originally from Turkey. Um, I wanted to, to engage with your, um, uh, with the women's dress issue and uh, my understanding is the Prophet uh, sort of at the time said cover yourselves to both men and women and uh, it was in that context meant to be not to be naked and but cover yourself in some form. Yet now, of course, fast forward to, uh, to 21st century, we have the emergence and actually uh, wide spreading of, the, um, of particular forms of covering uh, and uh, that, were, that weren't really part of the uh, traditions in, in Turkey when I was growing up, for example, in rural areas or urban areas. And uh, so, of course, in, in Europe, uh, people feel under siege. I mean, Europeans, uh, you know, Christian Europeans feel under siege from this uh, um, particular form of um, dress. And uh, so I was wondering if you engaged in this sort of ethical interpretation of covering issue in your writings. Yes, I, I, if you read the, the book Radical Reform, you will see that there is one chapter on this discussion, not especially on dress, but... Uh, 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 my position on this is, once again, quite clear. I think that if you come back to the scriptural sources and to the principles, uh, I wouldn't say that, you know, for example, covering the hair is something which is cultural. It's from the scriptural prescription is there. Now, the problem that I have with some Muslims is to, com to, is to confuse or to go straight to the formal way of dressing and forgetting the essential way of the spiritual dimension. That's fine. Now. It's an Islamic prescription, but it should be clear, and I kept on repeating this, and you heard this uh, with the Turkish uh, uh, you know, controversy with women being unable to go to the parliament, but also in France, by saying we have to be clear on this. It's against Islam to impose onto a woman to wear the headscarf. It's against human rights to impose onto a woman to take it off. If you are serious and consistent with the value, you let the people choose. It's not for you to say it's wrong or it's right. If she believes that this is coming from the Quran, let her do what she has to do. But if she believes that it's coming from the Quran and she doesn't want to wear it, there is no one in a society or in a family that has to impose it onto her. So this is why I was critical towards the Saudi government or the Iranian government by saying, that's not the way. Don't start by imposing. This is something which is an act of faith. And an act of faith is never something that has to be put under pressure. Let the people decide. But when, you know, you have in France, for example, people telling you, no, they never decide that they want to wear it. It's always the husband or the brother who is saying this. I say, no, look, I can bring you some. I say, no, 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 no. These women, they would say that they want to put it, but in fact they are doubly alienated because they, this is imposed and they think that they want. I say, oh, and if now they, you know what they think they want, so who is going to decide for whom? <laughs> so I think that the ethical here should be the objectives. Freedom of conscience is freedom of practice and this has to be protected. Now to come to the theoretical legal discussion about some people 
who wants to act against it by saying it's not Islamic, it's cultural. I think we are not, we'll never come to an agreement on this because you have the mainstream position of the Muslim scholars in the Shia and the Sunni tradition is an Islamic prescription. So instead of coming to is it Islamic or not, come to the principles and the objectives is respect the freedom of women if they want or if they don't and then let they decide what they want to do. I'm John Nesbitt from Montana State University. Um, you said that um, we speak too much on the way um, you pray and not enough about why you pray. So I ask, um, excuse me, <laughs> can there exist a man who follows the, or has the sound philosophy in his heart but lacks the, the adherence to the framework or the protective attitude towards um, the Quran, I guess, towards, towards Islam? That, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. You know, the people who are from the taqlidi or the literalist, once I said a non-practicing Muslim and someone stood up and said, that doesn't exist. I say sorry. I said, a non-practicing Muslim is not a Muslim because a Muslim is a practicing one. Okay, so we might now have to discuss what is practicing. But what you are saying is, the starting point should be quite clear that your relationship with God and the way you ponder over his presence, the meaning of your life, because at the end of the day, the relationship with God starts where you, you, ask, you are questioning the meaning of your life and your meaning of your death. This is why when the people are saying, you know, Islam is a, is a way of life, I'm saying, no, it's, it's a concept of life and death. It's also a concept of death. What is the meaning of my death? And then you, you go your, your way and, and you can come into something which is to practice your religion or practice Islam without coming to the formal practices. And when people are saying, I'm not a practicing Muslim, but they avoid lying. They serve the people. They serve the poor and say, you are already practicing. It's already Islam. Now, go you and know that there are some principles, for example, to, to pray, it's important in Islam, to fast. And you should understand also the meaning of limits. You will never, never find a spirituality or a religion which is telling you, trust your heart and you will be okay. All the religions, all the spiritualities even, even in the spiritual, the mystical, are always saying the only way to be free is to be disciplined. The way you are disciplined with your body, the way you are disciplined with your art is helping you to be free from your ego. At the end of the day, your ego will always prevail if you are not disciplined by knowing, okay, why do you, I pray, I'm disciplined myself. I spend three weeks with the Dalai Lama in India. At four o'clock in the morning, I was with him. At four o'clock in the morning, when the people are celebrating the good side of Buddhism, it's good, we are coming back, reincarnation, don't understand anything about what it means because it's bad news for the Buddhist reincarnation. It's not good news. And that way, coming back, we are happy. It's why coming back, it's sad. Suffering is starting again. <laughs> this is what it means. In the Buddhist tradition, suffering is there if we come back. So we have to liberate ourselves from suffering. And this is, this is something which is, and it means discipline. So this is where I'm always saying to people, yes, but if you go and you move with this in mind, at one point you ask yourself, why and how can I protect myself from my own ego? And this is where you understand the concept of limits. In fact, it's exactly like arts. Have you heard a very bright pi pianist? When he, he, he plays or she plays, it's as if he's improvising or she's improvising. You say, wow, it's so easy behind this, the hours of getting the technique. Freedom and being free with art is always based on techniques. Spirituality is telling you the same. Freedom with your heart means mastering yourself, controlling yourself, and it's not easy. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. I've really been enjoying the lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, well, I guess I'm from Montana State University as well. Um, in regard to the, the tribal mentality, I think that tends to uh, encapsulate a lot of the religious dialogue 
right now. Um, and it's very exclusive, like you were saying, in, and we have a lot of proselytizing and things of that nature. Where do you propose that we uh, start to have a, a reorientation from this uh, exclusive kind of way of viewing the world to this ec ethical uh, dialogue or discourse? What, what kind of shape do you see that taking in, in this uh, complex, globalized na world that we live in? Yes, that, that's a very interesting one. You know, I, I wrote a book called The Quest for Meaning, Developing a Philosophy of Pluralism, which is exactly tackling what you are saying. And this book was strange. It's one of the book I prefer, but it's not read on both sides, so to speak. For people of other faiths, they say, Tariq Ramadan, a Muslim intellectual, talking about philosophy and non-Muslim thing, no. When he speak about women, he sp should speak about headscarves. On the other side, the Muslims were thinking it's not in Islamic enough. You have to speak from within. And the essential dimension of this book is this, is when we enter into the world where we are now, you know, Islam is an American religion as much as Judaism, Christianity, and atheism is a philosophical reality in this country. And uh, agnosticism, many people, they don't know. And Buddhism is there. So when we enter into a pluralistic society, there is something that we should avoid, I would say, in order to be open to pluralism, to avoid that you are coming from somewhere. If you are a Christian, or if you are a, a Muslim or a Jew, just acknowledge this and know from where you come. One of the main problems that I have with many of my Western fellow citizens is not because that they are scared of me, it's that they don't know who they are. They have a, an identity crisis about their own self. So you might decide that you don't believe in all this, but at least put yourself as, what are my convictions? And to oppose convictions to open-mindedness, it's wrong. You can be convinced and open. And you can be doubtful about everything and very dogmatic. I have seen very dogmatic, skeptical minds. So I, I doubt, and you believe, and you are narrow-minded. So I'm sorry, the dogmatic between you and me is you, because you are a way of telling me that you doubt, which is very dogmatic. So I think that this is the starting point where we acknowledge that we start from somewhere. The second is to stop this competition business when it comes to the dialogue. It's to count how many we are converting. Some are entering the dialogue not to listen, but to talk. Some are entering the dialogue not to learn, but to convert. And I think that this is a problem. So we need to understand that uh, we need to know each other. And to know each other is to know the complexity of the other. It's not to romanticize, it's not to simplify, it's not to say there are good Muslims, bad Muslims, good Christians, bad Christians, good Jews, bad Jews. No, it's much more complex than this. And then I would say that the third dimension, so you, 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 you acknowledge your, that you come from somewhere. You acknowledge the fact that we have common values and we need to have a dialogue of the centers, not the periphery. Not the periphery of what we are dealing with as the challenges of our time, but very deep discussion about what I was saying, the concept of life, the concept of human being. Let us take time to speak about the spiritual dimension, the philosophical dimension, not only about the fact that we are all showing, showing solidarity towards the poor, that's fine, but the dialogue of the center is the third dimension. The last one is to come to something, and I was in this discussion this morning uh, 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 around this, is we have to work together uh, and I said this in another book called Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, is to work on practical challenges, is to work together. When I was in Mauritius, we launched a jihad against poverty. Jihad is not violence. Jihad is resistance and reform. You resist what is bad, poverty, and you reform to what is good, less poverty, the dignity of the people. So this is why we have to work together. So I ask yourself, you are in the United States of America. In this country and here in this city, you have many peoples coming from all the traditions. You will find all the traditions here. Yesterday, I was in a Japanese restaurant. So it means that you have people here who are dealing with the Buddhist tradition, the Confucianist tradition that they come from China. You have all the, tell me, I, I'm asking you a question. How many of you 
during the last months, how many have you met and how many people have you met coming from an other tradition than yours? How many people have you met and discussed with that are coming from Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism? How many people do you meet? It's very easy to say I'm open-minded in your closed world. It's a closed world. So to be open among ourselves, that's fine. I'm open. But it's not visible. And the United States of America now, a pluralistic society, if you want to resist and to come to this, is to come with more practical engagement together, talking about the, the center, and not to be shy to say, I'm coming from this tradition. People are not shy to say, I don't believe in God. And people shouldn't be shy to say, I believe in God. But not only I believe in God, I'm a practicing uh, believer. This also is part of uh, the, the sincere discussions that are needed. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Cynthia Douglas with the National U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce. And my question has to do with um, Islamic ethics and how it can inform the mediation or conflict resolution processes in the Middle East, specifically the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Oh yes, that, that, that's huge. I think that uh, um, in many ways, you know, the ethical background and the ethical objectives are essential in anything which has to do with peace and anything which has to do with conflict resolution. When I was to come to Notre Dame, I was normally in charge of, uh, you know, uh, 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 religion and peace building, uh, 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 peace building. This was this was what I wanted to be involved with, and it was all based on the ethical teachings that we find into uh, the Islamic tradition. Now, be careful. Many of the scholars, by the way, they think that if we come to the ethical ground, if is that that we want to avoid dealing with the legal framework and the legal dimension, and I don't think it's right. The ethical is not undermining the legal. It's uh, uh, clarifying and enlightening the legal dimension. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, uh, I'm not sure the ethical ground will make it easier when it comes to peace building, because it's not going to make it easier, but it's going to make it demanding. If we agree on the fact that we are calling for respecting the dignity of human beings. If we agree on the fact that the life of every single individual has the same value, that you cannot say that the life of a Palestinian is less valuable than the life of an Israeli or an American. If you put things into the ethical framework, you come and you say with clarity, there will be no peace if there is no justice. Of course, we need with justice, forgiveness, compassion, that's all fine, we need this. You cannot just, you know, the people who are worshiping justice can be very dogmatic and very tough. They say, this is my right and they come. No, we need to have something which is justice and, and we have it in the Quran, in Allah Ya'muru Bil Ad, Wal Ihsan, there is something which is justice and something which is beyond, which is a way you look at things that goes beyond your rights, but with a sense of compassion and forgiveness and understanding. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we need to come with a sense of uh, an ethical framework coming uh, as something which is the starting point of our discussion. And, uh, but I'm, I'm, once again, it means that the peace process, for example, should be based on clear uh, uh, principles as to the ethical principles on which we should agree. And we should agree that, for example, we have, yes, two people, and the two peoples and the two populations, they have the right for a state, they have the right for the same dignity, and uh, we can't just, in ethical terms, you know, just to put it clearly, I'm a Swiss citizen, and uh, uh, my foreign minister, Calmiret, when what happened in Gaza in 2006, she said at one point, say, look, there is an ethical discussion here. It's a neutral state. You know that Swiss are always neutral. That's good. <laughs> They're all fine. And she said something which was in ethical terms very important. She said, you know, when an elephant 
is dealing with the mouth. To take a neutral position is to take the position and the support of the elephant. Neutrality here means something. It means that you, you are on the side of the powerful. An ethical stand sometimes is to take a stand by saying, I'm on the side of the oppressed. I cannot be neutral in all the circumstances. Some of the citizens in the United States sometimes just not to be involved in the thing and say, I'm neutral. Both are wrong and both are right. I'm sorry. That's not an ethical stand. An ethical stand is to say there are people who are oppressed. There are rights that are not protected. And there is dignity that is not recognized. Let us start with this. And then you come with the ethical rights. And, and for example, I took a position which was to go and to tell me that in the name of Islam, you can go and you can kill an innocent Israeli because you think that you are oppressed and you can do it, I would say on an ethical ground you can't do this. An innocent and an in is an innocent and you cannot kill. I, this is my ethical position. This in the context of saying that there, is, there are people who are oppressed today and they should be respected and their dignity should be protected and we should have a peace based on the basic element of justice, which is not the case. So I wouldn't come, and it should be, you know, I'm, I'm advocating a nonviolent movement, a global nonviolent movement of resistance towards the oppression, but I don't want ethics to come as a way to avoid questioning the practices of a government by saying it's only ethical. No, we have, in the, you know, in fact, ethics mean to be courageous. You have to be courageous in the name of ethics. You have to say to a government, what you are doing is unacceptable. I'm not going to accept this. And I kept on repeating this yesterday, and I would tell you this on an ethical ground. You know, I'm advocating in one of the books, I'm not advocating citizenship. When I was asked, you know, you have the Muslims should be citizens, I say, yes, citizens is good. Be an American citizen. Be an American citizen. But an American citizen, in ethical terms, is a, an ethics of citizenship. And ethics of citizenship is you have to speak out when your government is doing things that are unethical or supporting unethical behavior or, 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 or practicing from behind the scene things that are unethical. So don't use ethics as something which is avoiding the political discussion. When you are with the, on the side of ethics, you should ask your government, what about you know, uh, the way you deal with dictators? how you deal with innocent people. Can't you just imagine in the ethical terms now when it comes to the conflict between Israeli and Palestinians that it's quite clear now that in our mindset slowly with time, our perception is the life of the Palestinians is less valuable than the life of Israeli and Americans and Western. This is what is happening now. And it's a, it's, a, it's a superficial, but it's not a superficial, it's an implicit message. The world can be quiet when 1,500 people, Palestinians, are killed in Gaza, innocent, and we don't, we don't talk about this. So I would say I would support anything which is a peace, uh, 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 you know, uh, conflict resolution based on nonviolence, on ethical ground, but this should be based on position of principles that we have to start with and not avoiding talking about this and say, okay, let us talk about, you know, a kind of accommodation as to peace and forgetting the principles of the human dignity. Uh, this is the minimum that we have to, to give to the oppressed people. This is the minimum. The minimum is we acknowledge that your dignity is as valuable as ours. And I would like to have this said to African people who are lost in conflicts and to Palestinians. I'm not sure that this is what they think and what they feel. So let us start with this discourse. This is my position on the conflict, the starting position, then many other things could be said. Uh, we have time for one last question. Hi, I'm Spencer Mullins. I'm from the University of Utah. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramadan, for your lecture. Very fascinating. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the, with Egypt and the problems it's having with, what would you consider your position is, do you think the claims of the minorities today, after the Arab Spring, 
they have been saying that they find themselves in a worse off position. And they find that they say the Constitution is not, is very, is tilted. And the minorities such as Coptics and other Islamic minorities such as Sufis and won't have a, a respected identity. And I was wondering what your position was on that. And do you find the comments made by other um, um, uh, Islamic legal scholars from Oxford and other countries, they have said that the Constitution is deemly unacceptable and that Mr. Morsi should concede certain grounds and allow uh, a better democratic process. Thank you very much. Uh, I have talked about this yesterday a bit, about the situation, and this was the topic of yesterday. Uh, but quite quickly, and once again, we can connect this in ethical, on ethical terms, what could be the position. Uh, I don't know, you know, if you go on my website, you will see that every two weeks I'm writing on the situation, and I have been writing a lot on Egypt, of course, uh, uh, after the book, uh, The Arab Awakening, which is uh, focusing on this, by saying that, yes, there are concerns uh, for uh, the religious minorities uh, in Egypt, but not only because of the constitution is deeper than that. I think that what is happening now is a complete unsettled situation. So. I would say that even the Muslims and, 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 and you know, the ordinary citizens should be concerned and worried about what is happening because it's completely... So I think that to reduce this to the constitution and to reduce this to the power today, it's too simplistic. It's now what is missing in Egypt is a deep uh, 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 collective discussion with all the political powers and trends uh, to face the challenges of the country, and, and I talked about this yesterday, we are not talking about this. So, so once again, the problem of the constitution, for example, should be addressed, but it was supposed to be a transitory period to, to go towards something else, and we keep on coming back to the constitution and the polarization, and we avoid the big questions of our time because many of the, 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 the Coptic and, and other people are saying, okay, let us move on and try to see what we can reform. Today we are not talking about this. We are stuck to something which is a very uh, uh, superficial and damaging uh, uh, political discussion about these things. The most important thing about the, the Constitution today is not the fact that uh, the, 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 the rights are, uh, of the minorities are not very, very much protected. You can find a way to read the text where they are protected. But what is very worrying, is something which is different, is the way the Egyptian constitution is protecting the army and its prerogatives and the interest and the independence and the financial autonomy and the fact they are not judged for what they did in the past they are more powerful now than they were before in the name of a new constitution. This is very worrying. And this could, they could destroy the future of the country if we are not clear on where should the army be in a civil state. This is the question that we have to tackle instead of playing the divisions from within and not understanding the common challenges. The civil state with the pluralistic dimension in Egypt should deal with this understanding for all of, all of the Egyptians. The role of the army is the most dangerous thing for the year to come. It's, it's really dangerous. And as I said yesterday, the army could decide tomorrow that it's over and it will be over because they are very powerful in economic terms and in political terms today. So uh, I think that we have to come with critical questions on these dimensions. Thank you so much anyway for coming. <laughs>